Hi, I'm Susanna Bowling, and this is live from the Hotel Edison, Times Square Chronicles presents. When I was younger, I had this teacher that told me that I was never going to be anything because I was interested in so many things. And my guest today has proven her wrong. He is an actor, a writer, a director, a producer. He was nominated for a SAG Award for Boardwalk Empire. He was in The Blacklist, Gotham, and he has about 43 credits to his name. Go to IBD, IMDb and you will see it. He also has created a new company called Entertain Access, which is about to revolutionize the way that the theater, TV, film industry works. It's basically interconnecting all of them to make it a industry that works. He helped start a magazine. He owned a marketing company, and he's a real estate mogul. We're talking Nicholas Calhoun. Nick, I love that you do everything because that teacher really made me mad. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's, you could always do stuff. There's no reason you have to get, put yourself in one little niche. So why not? Why not experiment and do as much as you can as long as you're going to do it good? Well, I have so many questions to ask you. I guess the first one I should ask is, you started a magazine. Yeah, that was, you know, that was a happenstance. I left my job to start my uh, graphic design and marketing company um, when I was 21 years old. Um, I just got tired of doing all the work for somebody else already at an early age. And um, I got approached by somebody who said, I have an idea for a magazine. Would you want to be our creative director and co-owner? And we came up with this really great idea um, of putting magazines in basically every college that really specified their college. So it was called University Magazine, and it was kind of like a, a, a fun expose on you know the sports, cheerleading, everything that goes on in their colleges, but it was real people at their school. So when you look, open up a magazine, you know I go to school with this quarterback, I go to school with this cheerleader, and we did that in certain uh, schools, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> after a couple uh, months, we got sued by somebody who, it was a women's rights group, and we did nothing, nothing that was bad at all. And the other co-owner just got so nervous that he was like, I can't deal with this, I can't deal with lawsuits, I'm done. And I had the opportunity to continue going with it myself, but I said to myself, I already have a company that's going, and, and it was starting to grow at that point, and I said, okay, then I guess that's the end of it. Um, and I'm, you know, looking back, I really wish we continued going because we had a lot of ad revenue coming in and we had potential to really blow, blow it up into something that was special. But, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's the way it works. I have to admit, you know, in owning a newspaper, people come after me all the time, but I'm bitchy. I am. And I'm like, yeah, really, seriously, go ahead, read this. Yeah. I was, I was in a position where I, I was really young. I just bought a house um, myself. And, you know, just as nervous as he was, we didn't have money for a lawyer. So when he said, I'm out, I was like, I, I can't fight this myself. And it wasn't even a real fight. It was just like people sending us blind letters to say, shut this down because you didn't have permission to film here, do this here. And we had permission to do everything we did. And everybody was on board. It was just one of those things where you went, do we fight this and possibly lose everything that we have right now, or do we just move on? And we decided to move on, and like I said, I really regret it. I, re I, I really wish we would have pushed back. Uh, people try to do this to me all the time. I mean, I, I would say I get one to two letters a day telling me, oh, you don't have rights to this, you don't have rights for that, and I'm like, yeah, really go talk to the publicist. Um, you just got a film. Talk about that. The one I'm acting in or the one I'm producing? Well, you're producing two, and you're acting in one, so let's talk about the acting first. Uh, the one I'm acting in is um, a really hilarious comedy called Gutter Muckers, starring Jim Belushi, Leslie Jones, Bobby Lee, Lil Ray Howard, uh, Lil Rel, How uh, Lil Rel Howard um, and me. Um, it's hilarious. We're filming in Montana. We actually start filming the end of uh, next week, and we film all the way through September. Um, I, it's a hilarious script, and I really just can't wait for it to come out already. It's going to be great. Um, and tell us about the films you're producing, because you're working with Sir Anthony Hopkins. I am, yes. I'm doing a, producing a, a Nick Cassavetes film with, right now with Shia LaBeouf, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Uh, we haven't announced our other lead, but trust me, he is spectacular. 
Um, we're filming in Antarctica, which is the first film ever shot in Antarctica because it's uh, impossible to get permission from Antarctica to film there. Um, we have the support of a lot of really major companies. I don't want to say too much because I, I don't think the news is out there yet, but uh, it's very, very exciting. I mean, it's a $26 million budget film. Um, I, I got it from a friend of mine uh, whose name is Dan Sheldon. He's a producer on the project, and he brought it to me and just said, would you want to be involved? And I said, Nick Cassavetes, of course I'd be involved. <laughs> you know, The Notebook. Um, More importantly, iconic. Yeah, yeah, exactly, iconic. And, you know, being able to even have my name in a conversation with people of that level just feels special to me. You know, I, I don't know what it's going to do for my career. I don't know if it's going to help anything. You know, I've been told I'm going to be in it in some capacity as an actor. Um, but just being, being able to say that I had something to do with this script, because this script is brilliant. It's, it's heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. It's a true story. Um, about a, a gentleman who goes to Antarctica and kind of um, falls in love with the idea of these penguins that no one's ever been able to approach or get, get really nice photos of. He's a professional photographer. And he goes there and he kind of has this weird bond with the penguins where they start approaching him. Um, yeah, and in, in between all of that, his brother's in New York, an investment banker, who's selling these photos that he's selling back. So this gentleman's in Antarctica and doesn't even know that he's becoming a multimillionaire his brother's selling his photography in America. So when he comes back to America, the first time before he goes back, he meets a girl and falls in love. And she ends up going back to Antarctica with him the second time. Um, and, you know, she doesn't love it as much as he loves it. But it becomes a really nice love story between them as a couple, him as a photographer, and, you know, just the entire environment. And seeing the pictures and videos from Antarctica, it's, I cannot believe it's a part of this world. Wait, do you get to play with the penguins? I don't. It costs a lot of money to bring somebody to Antarctica. Um, so when we first signed on, that was the first thing I said. I said, I'm going to Antarctica. And they told me the price of each person, and I said, I'm not going to Antarctica. Um, <laughs> because I'm not going to waste money just so I can go there and hang out. Not to mention, as much as it sounds amazing, watching the videos, like the dailies, it is freezing. I mean, you see the, video, like the mustaches have all like the crystals on them and stuff like that. And I go, I don't know if I want to be there. I like air conditioning. I don't think I like Antarctica, but won't find out yet. Now you're doing a second film as well. Yeah. Producing. Yeah. Um, I'm actually producing Gutter Muckers, which I, uh, oh, you are? yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm also producing uh, And Love Knocked, um, which is a really hilarious uh, romantic comedy. Um, I don't want to say too much about the plot. It's, it's a great cast. It's a great group of people. Um, it's going to film in New York, uh, which is nice. Um, I think we're filming also in Kansas, somewhere. Um, yeah, we, we, we haven't established that yet. It's, everything's based on tax credits and stuff like that when it comes to film. Um, and that's just a, another, you know, it's a, it's a smaller budget, which makes it a little bit easier, a little bit easier to manage the people. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about all of it. You know, the, the fact that me and I have a, a writing partner, uh, Keith Lynch, who's uh, also uh, a producer on all three of these projects and the fact that we get to do this together is just really really what's making it special for me um, to be able to be in this world and have some input on the industry that I've loved since the day I was born it's just really special to me I've always told my wife like if I could make a project that I look over and you're crying because of how that film it, it, you know made you feel then I won um, and that'll just really just make my day and, and you know, I think all three of these projects really have that potential. You know, the last one, it, you'll probably laugh because you're, you'll probably cry because you're laughing so much. Mm -hmm. um, but the first two are just really, really heartfelt projects. And, and I, I think they're going to be really special. You know me well. When I laugh, I cry. <laughs> it's true. Um, how did you get started in the business? Oh, okay. Um, that's a very interesting story. Um, I've always wanted to be an actor since the day I was born. Uh, I did everything, you know, small theater stuff in, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. I always kind of kept it under wraps. Um, I kind of thought the world wanted me to be something I wasn't, you know, like, like I, I always thought like my dad wanted me to be an athlete, you know, uh, you yeah, people, yeah, people looked at me like, what, you're doing theater? And I, I just kind of got to a point in my life where I said, you know what, I, I don't care anymore what people think of me and it was it wasn't that old you know I was 21 
I ended up um, in the ho- hospital with a heart problem. Um, and after a couple days of uh, being in the ICU, I, I said to my, my dad and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, I said weeks prior to this, I said, I, I don't know if I could do this anymore. And they said, what do you mean? You're making a lot of money. You know, it's a good job. And, and this is before I started my company. And I said, I just, I just don't feel healthy anymore. Like I was, wasn't sleeping. Anymore. I was sleeping on the floor of my office. Like it was that kind of weird um, attitude. And I went home and I started having these like chest pains and my arm was going numb and, you know. You're having anxiety attacks. Well, that's what, that's what one would think. So, um, and I said to my, my wife, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, she said, you're having an anxiety attack. I go, no, I'm not because I just finished the project that I've been working on for months. I said, I feel so good right now. I said, I can't breathe. So she goes, you know, go get a glass of water, take a shower and see how you feel. I walked downstairs, I got halfway back up the stairs and I collapsed. Yeah, luckily I had a roommate, I got to his room and I was like, hospital, hospital. He took me to the hospital and uh, after two days, 11 different uh, cardiologists, they uh, diagnosed me with a periocarditis, which isn't that big of a deal. What is that? It's an, it's an infection around the sac of your heart. So every time your heart beats, it hits the infection. So it would cause my heart, it would cause the, the, the heart to hit the sac the sac would cause you know, pain signals to my brain, which would cause me to breathe heavier, which would cause the pain to intensify. So you know, they kept me drug-induced for two days, and, they kept, and I kept going, I feel great now. And as soon as the drugs would wear off, I'd go, nope, it's back, it's back, it's back. And then eventually they found it out, and it was simple. Like, it was like, take a couple, you know, couple pills for the next couple weeks, and you're fine. The good news is, I wasn't going to go to the hospital. My wife said, go to the hospital, stop being so stubborn. If I didn't go to the hospital, that would have been a chronic periocarditis, and I would have had that pain the rest of my life. Yeah, so she essentially saved my life. But while I was there, I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm not listening to anybody anymore. I called my dad the next day. I said, hey, dad, I'm going to quit. Now, keep in mind, the week before this, both of them said, don't quit. Both him and my wife said the same exact thing. When I said, I'm going to quit, they both said verbatim, I think that's a good idea. And I said, Okay, so then I called my sister, who um, is a singer. She uh, went to Westminster Choir College, and I said, hey, how does one go about starting trying to be an actor? She said, oh, there's some, you know, there's some outlets and blah, 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 and I said, let's do it, and I just started. Like, I, I went to my first audition, and weirdly enough, I booked it. It was a short film, and I got on set, and they're using lingo that I've never heard of, so I'm kind of going, I'm kind of like looking around going, um, could somebody explain to me what that means? Because uh, you weren't in theater in high school. <laughs> I, was in, I was in theater, but I'd never, I've never been in a film. I've never even been in front of a camera. They didn't talk about that? The, the, no, no, no. My, I mean, I, I'm talking small, you know, small, small, small theater, small school theaters. Um, so, you know, they're using words, and I'm kind of going, yeah, 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 I get that. And then I'm looking away going, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so the whole time I'm just kind of going, yeah, I get that. And then they'd say it again louder and get mad at me, and I'd be like, Okay, could, could you just explain, to, like, just explain to me like I'm two years old, you know, what are you talking about? And they would say, and I'd be like, okay, use, the, use those words. Um, and the project came out great, you know, it was, it was a, a short film, it wasn't meant to do anything other than go to film festivals or whatever, but it came out really great, and it kind of gave me this, like, I felt home. But you started a reel. Yes, it, it, and I started a reel, and I had some footage, and, and it was cool to have that stuff because, you know, sometimes it takes years to get footage to be able to use for a reel. Um, but I just, I, I've, I've only ever felt, like, comfortable in, like, certain situations, and, like, in front of a camera, and it, even with millions of people standing around staring at me, I just feel, like, really at home and really at peace. Like, I'm never happy, 100% happy, which I don't think most people are, unless I'm with my kids, with my wife, or working and television, film, or even theater. Um, and I just felt like this is it. This is the world I want to be in. And I continued growing my company, my marketing company, which I still own today. Um, because I also knew... Very smart. Yeah. Fallback job, one you like. Well, it was also controlling my own timeline, right? You know, if I work for somebody else, they're going to expect me to be there 9 to 5, 9 to 9 for most jobs nowadays. So I said to myself, I'll dedicate my time to this. And ironically, I, ha- I, I do uh, event management and event production as part of the, my company. And the first day of Boardwalk Empire, I had a red carpet event for FX Networks that I completely ran head to toe. So I called the theater and I said, hey, I 
know this is weird. I am an actor. They don't know that I'm an actor. I have to work on the show tomorrow, so I can't set up. Could I come tonight and set up? I said, I'll pay you guys whatever you want me to pay you to have somebody stand there and watch me. And by the grace of God, he said, that is so cool. I love that show. Yes, come on in. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is working out. And ironically, that day we had a walk away lunch too. So here I am in a 1930s suit and top hat walking up to my event saying hi to all my clients. They're like, why are you dressed like that? I'm like, long story. I'll tell you all about it later. And I went back to set and I went back to the party that night and had a blast. But it was my first day. And, you know, if I didn't do that first day, I wouldn't have been in the entire series. So it, it really worked out. I mean, God is good. You've done some of my favorite series, actually. Gotham, The Blacklist. What of all the 45, 43, somewhere near there? I counted. It's on IBD, IMDb. Um, what was your favorite and why? I have to go to Boardwalk Empire. I mean, it was like a family by the time I left there. I, you know, Steve Buscemi is by far the nicest human being I've ever met. I mean, like, I wish I can call him Uncle Steve and not be weird about it. He was such a nice person, made everybody's life easier. He's, he's a consummate actor, too. I've never seen him hold a script. I've never seen him look at his lines in between takes. He always knew his job. He was always there, always there on time, really respectful, knew every single person on set by name. He was just a perfect human being. And I spent seven months on that show, you know, and, and to me, like, again, every day was like going to like, like, yeah, to a dream, you know, and, and it would just, it was, it was one of those things where I went, holy, holy crap, this could actually work. You know, like maybe I am meant to be here. And I had an, an acting coach, Anthony Abison, um, brilliant man who used to say to us, you know, if you're in that room, you deserve to be in that room. So I remember sitting there one day with, you know, me, Steve Buscemi, Terry Winters, who's the creator, um, Tim Van Patten, who's one of the producers, and, and sitting in a circle and having just casual conversation. And I left there and I, I emailed my agents and my managers and I said, they, 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 like, they like accepted me. And she was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm like they accepted, I'm like, I'm a, like, they didn't act like I was like some weirdo, like it was like over, like I actually spoke, they listened, they, I was like, this is weird to me. And they're like, Nick, you're a part of the cast. I was like, I know, but like, I've never, I've never would have thought, you know, as much as I want it, I just never thought I'd get to that level. And, you know, that relatively quick, I mean, it was 10 years, but relatively quick. I think that's one of the things I like most about you is that your resume, you've done a lot of stuff before Bar Boardwalk Empire, and yet you're still like a little kid and excited. I think that's wonderful. I, I emailed the, 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 um, the uh, writer and producer and, and lead of Guttermuckers yesterday and I said, holy crap, how cool is this? You're making a movie, like that's amazing. Because you know it's hard to get several million dollars to make a movie and he's kind of at the same level as I am as an actor. And I, I, I'm, I just never want to pretend I'm better than anything or anyone or any situation or, you know, I really just want to be a part of a community where we all appreciate each other and hard work and talent just pays off. Um, which, you know, I think we're going to go back to at some point in, in this crazy business. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just a nerd from, you know, born in the Bronx, grew up in New Jersey and, and I happen to be like cool enough that my kids think I'm cool right now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you're in some of their favorite shows. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. Well, they keep saying, Daddy, when can we watch you? And I'm like, not that one, not that one, not that one. Um, you know, I let them watch like Blacklist and I'm like, but there's guns in it. They're like, it's okay. And they're like, Dad, did you shoot a gun? And I'm like, yeah, I did. Uh, you know, but like a lot of this stuff, you know, you can't watch like Boardwalk Empire. I get my head blown off at the end. Um, you know, I'm not going to put my kids through that yet. Uh, <laughs> even, even the new one, you know, Gutter Muckers, like I'm, I'm going to Montana to film uh, the week of my daughter's birthday party and I sat my beautiful children down and, and I said to her, I said, Hey baby, I got great news and I got bad news. I said, great news is daddy booked a movie. Oh my God, that's great. Dad. I said, but it's the day of your birthday party. She went and I said, baby, I don't have to do it. I could quit. No, 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 daddy. You're doing it. You're doing it. She's like, it's just my party. It's not my actual birthday. I said, you have no idea how special you are, kid. I literally getting emotional now, like they're just such great kids. And now that they think I'm cool, like it just makes my day. Um, but it's always funny because like I always say to people, nobody ever asks me about my job. Everyone always asks me about acting. 
you know, my job is 100% of my time. Acting's like <laughs> negative 1% of my time. Um, but it's, it's always hilarious because everyone's always like acting so cool, acting so cool. And I kind of just started having this like weird mentality of like, oh, it's just a job, but it, it is very cool. And I understand it's very cool, but it is just a job at the end of the day. You know, like I hope it's my full-time job one day. Um, yeah, but you threw a party for FX. Okay, that's cool. So job not so uncool. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's my, been my goal since the beginning. When I started my company, I used to work for a company that did a lot of stuff for home builders. Um, so naturally, I kind of went into that. You know. Bob the Builder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I had a lot of their clients approaching me, and I said no to a lot of them because, you know, I'm, I'm really ethical about certain things. But I went out and got my own clients, but I kept saying to myself, I want to do what I do for the industry I want to be in, not the industry I don't want to be in. So I started trying to find ways to get into the industry. Yeah. So, you know, I approached Fox. Um, they used to own FX. Now Disney owns them. And I started doing like small things for them. You know, I created a logo for them. I, uh, I did some window film, some small signage. And then it blew up into this like um, weird situation where they had a red carpet event and they couldn't get anything done. Their, their company that did it was in California. So they called me and they go, do you know anybody that could do step and repeats at the time? I don't even think I knew what Step and Repeat was. I think I Googled it that night, and I found the company that would do it, and I found the company that would do it for the next day, and I had all the pieces shipped to me that, like, that next day. In the morning, I'm putting them all together going, what the hell, where else does this go? And I put it together, and I did one single Step and Repeat. That led to me doing you know, a single Step and Repeat and like some other stuff at the party, and then it turned into me taking over their parties and doing all of the branding, which is amazing. Then I started doing their upfronts, Upfronts are big business. Yeah. You know, then it turned into doing work for Big Ten Network, Discovery, you know, and now I have HBO, CBS, I, you know, I have all Fortune 500 companies and I get to be a part of this industry. But the problem is, I'm still just acting because none of those people know I'm an actor. None of them. Some people have found out, a couple of my clients that I became friendly with, they're like, you know, I Googled you and I'm like, oh God. You know they might after this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with it. I'm fine being outed at this point. I just, because I wasn't reality, trying to out you. No, my reality is that they should understand what I'm going to be and what I am. And at this point, I've been in that business for 20 years and they know my reputation and they know I'm going to make sure that no matter what happens where my career is, I'm going to make sure their events are perfect because I still need them. Um, and even if I didn't need them, if I got cast tomorrow in a huge film and somebody said, here's, you know, $10 million, you know, that'll never happen. I would still make sure the stuff that's on my schedule is completed because that's just the kind of person I am. I don't, I don't ever want to leave anybody hanging. Um, but yeah, it's great that I get to be a part of the industry. And it's always funny because now I'm telling people like, Hey, um, when, when we do a red carpet, could I do it? And my, my agent's going, don't you want to walk? I go, I go, yeah, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll set it up. And then I'll go to the bathroom, I'll change it to my suit, and then I'll walk. I go, and then when everyone's watching it, I'll take it down. I go, and then I'll change back into my suit, and then I'll go to the party, no one will even know. And they're like, do you really wanna deal with all that? I go, I need to feed my family. I still need to feed my family. Yes, I'll do all that. They're like, okay, it's yours. So I just, you know, I came from very humble beginnings. My, my, we, me and my brother lived in a group home with my mom and dad when we were born um, in the Bronx. And you know, I always say like, we didn't have anything we wanted. We had everything we needed. Um, my mom and dad are spectacular human beings. Um, and they always busted their butts to make sure that like, we always went fed horrible, horrible food though. Um, <laughs> but we were always fed. We always had clothes on our, you know, on our backs. It, most of the time they were hand-me-downs from my cousin, Mike. Um, but you know, we always had everything that we, we needed. Um, we never got to go on trips. We never got to go. We couldn't go to like simple things like friends would go to carnivals. We couldn't go. And I kind of always envied my father because he never really cared about what other people thought. Like he, he had the mentality of I'm going to provide for my family and that's it. And you know, he, he's, he's there. My mom and dad are just amazing, amazing human beings. And I kind of have the same work ethic they have, but a little bit more. I want to provide for my kids, but I also want to provide enough for them where at some point I go, you don't have to work as hard as daddy. There is a part of me that wants to put you in schools to teach people this philosophy because I think this is part of the reason our world is so in trouble because the family has broken down. Yeah. 
um, I've actually done uh, speeches for like a, there's a program now that used to be called Dare. Uh, yeah, um, and I've done speeches for schools where I, I kind of explain you know that attitude of of you don't have to be smart or wealthy to get wealthy. You could literally just work hard, you know. And if you work hard and you put your time and energy into something enough, you could be successful at any level. There's no reason you can't excel in anything you want to do if you actually put your heart to it. And I know that sounds like a silly thing, but I'm not a genius. I'm not, I don't, I don't even consider myself smart. You know, like my writing partner is so much smarter than I am that sometimes like he'll send me stuff and I'll be like, I just, okay, I just work my butt off and I know how to speak. I know how to speak to other people and that's a big part. And you have an ethic yes. and, a, and a drive in a strange way. Yes, I mean, everybody who knows me will be like, nobody works harder than Nick, nobody. And it's it, in what's great about like because of I run my own businesses, I still get to go like toss the softball with my kids. You know, like I'll say like I'm taking my lunch break at 5 p.m. And they're like, what do you mean your lunch break at 5 p.m.? I'm like, my lunch breaks at 5 p.m. because I'm going to go to softball with my kids and I'm going to coach them. And everyone's like, that's amazing. But, you know, people sometimes I, I've had friends of mine that go, you know, uh, it comes easy to you. I'm like, call me at midnight any night. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, call me at midnight any night. I'm at my computer. I said, when my kids go to sleep, me and my wife sit on the couch, we have time together. When my wife goes to sleep, if she's not on her computer as well, I go back to my computer and I work until I can't work anymore. And then I, no, it's okay. And then I wake up the next morning and I start it over. I just don't feel like wasting time, you know. I do the same thing. I work till like three or four in the morning and people know that they can call me, which is, I wish they didn't know that because I'm working. Now they do. <laughs> oh no, they've already known it. <laughs> no, I mean, time is our greatest commodity, right? You, you hear it all the time and, and time is our greatest commodity and, and I'm not going to waste a single second. You know, I, I, I see that thing, what's it like uh, a billion, you know, uh, seconds in a year or whatever like that. Oh, so if you had a billion dollars, would you throw away millions of it? No. So I'm not going to throw away millions of my seconds. I want to utilize every single opportunity I can to try to grow something. And sometimes it feels wasted because I'm like reading a script and then I have to remind myself, this isn't enjoyment you're doing this for work like even watching a movie sometimes I go I'm gonna go see this movie and I, and I go oh god two hours but usually what I'll do is I'll go to a movie by myself I'll sit in the back and I'll still be working on my phone um but I, I wish I could do that I I'm at plays almost every day of my life and I I'm not allowed to do that yeah you'll get shanked if you if you're on your phone at a play um no yeah that's why I like movies and I like going by myself so nobody bothers me and I sit in the corner and my wife makes fun of me She's like, he's such a weirdo. He goes to movies by himself. And I just, I love it. Like, sit my big, my giant popcorn and I'm sitting on my phone. And nobody bothers me. Like, usually it's like the last week of the run so that no one's in the theater. I, I don't know why I just enjoy it. I, th I think also in my brain, it makes me feel like it's my personal theater. Mm. You know, like, this is my home theater. It just happens to be in a Lowe's. Wait, don't you ever have to go to uh, the events where they invite you to the screenings? Oh, yeah. Those are my favorite. Yeah, I love, I love that. Just because the energy is, is, infectious i mean the people there the cast and crew and and you know even everybody involved is so excited when they get to see their product anybody the, the, the assistant to the makeup person so excited to be there just to say to their friends look i did, I did that makeup i did that. yeah that's not how it gets to, to be for me i'm normally in a theater with about anywhere from five to 15 critics and there you can feel the energy in the air of oh i've gotta i've gotta do that i've gotta Get that, and I'm like. How does that side work? Do, do you guys like take notepads and write stuff in the, or you just all memory and then you go home and say? I think different people have different ways. Most people take notepads, I don't. I don't even read, I get in trouble for this. My, my publicist gets mad at me all the time for this. I don't even read my playbill until after I write my review or as I'm writing my review. Um, for me, it's like Hollywood Squares and acting, writing, direction, sound, everything's in boxes. And when the lines between the, box it, the boxes blur, ah, oh, I'm seeing a good show. When, I'm start, when I stop trying to critique it, it's a good show. That's great. Honestly, that's a great attitude to have and great energy to have because you're then focused on what's actually going on rather than, you know, I gotta get that note down. And, and also when you read a playbill, you're kind of skewed into thinking someone's great, whether they're great or not. So it, it kind of makes your brain go, you know, oh, they're not as good as 
that looked like. So when you don't read the playbill before, I think that's really smart. I think all critics should do that, to be honest with you, because... Well, I try to see a play like somebody off the street. I already know too much. I already... Like, there's a play coming called The Hills of California that I can't wait to see because I love Jez Butterworth's work and Sam Mendes is directing. So I don't care what the rest of the thing is like because <laughs> I know that that's a combination I'm probably going to love. Um, but I try not to know because when people buy tickets to shows, a lot of times they don't know what it is. Yeah. So I try that. Now, let's get into something else. And you know which we're going to? Where we're going? MJ yeah, let's talk about that. I, I mean, I, it came to me from my business partner. We've been talking about this for years, um, and she's brilliant. And, uh, you know, she came to me and said, hey, what, what do you think about doing this? And I kind of always said, like, well, the industry needs it. Um, I was like, this is, a, this is an undertaking. And, and, you know, I already run a successful company, so why am I going to do this when I'm already running something that's, you know, allowing me to feed my family and keep a roof over our heads and be able to do what I want to do? I said, all I'm doing is creating more work for myself. And she kept going, she kept going, she kept going. And then I said, yeah, I, you know, I, if maybe, maybe. And one day I get an email, and it's a 19-page uh, business proposal to me about how we could do it and what we could do in different levels. And I said, oh, God, we're going to do this, aren't we? And she was like, yes, we are. Wait, tell the audience what it is. <laughs> so it's a platform that essentially brings uh, actors, casting directors, producers, and directors all together on one platform. Um, it allows them to pretty much keep all of their business on one platform, but it also allows actors to find roles in different projects that casting directors and producers are putting out in the world for people to see. The difference between other platforms and our platform is we have everything on one unified platform. So you don't have to you know, record a video and take it off of the platform, put it on Vimeo, send that link to Vimeo, your agent or manager downloads it. They have to send a link to the, you know, the producers or casting directors. It'll be all on one page. We have a calendar system that rivals the best calendar systems in the world. Uh, a task management system, same thing, rivals some of the best task management systems in the world. Our developers are at the top of their game. Um, and we're, basically what we want to do is give everyone a reason to leave our competitors. Um, and I think we've done it tenfold. Are we not mentioning them? Because I will. Breakdowns, which everybody wants and can't get. If you're an actor, it is what's happening. It really is casting. Um, but also talk about how they're going to be able to do the Zoom interviews with AI. Yeah. So um, right now, the process of auditioning is uh, mostly self-tapes, which means you, you do an audition with a reader. The problem with that becomes, you know, a lot of people are working and they have to schedule their uh, self-tape auditions around other people's schedules and around their own schedules because they need a helper. So we had created a one-of-a-kind technology, which is patent pending, which we're really excited about, where um, a human will be able to interact with an AI artificial intelligence avatar so that I'll read my lines and the AI will read the, the other opposing party's lines. So you'll no longer need a scene partner. So if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you come home from your you know, waiter job or, you know, whatever job or a party that you went to and you say, oh God, my auditions, which is exactly, you know, we're, we're night owls for the most part, actors and actresses. Um, you'll be able to come home and do your self tape on the, in the moment without the help of somebody else. And to me, I think that's going to just change the world because we, we launched beta today. Um, yeah. yes. Uh, so to a select few, yes, yeah. so I'm so excited about it because you know, when I get an audition for, say, a commercial, something that, I don't mean to scoff at commercials, but a commercial. They make a lot of money. They make a ton of money, and, and I'll do it. Um, <laughs> uh, they, uh, you know, the problem with commercials is, it's like, you know, if, I, if I'm doing a Dunkin' Donuts commercial, my audition c consists of, like, could I have a coffee? And then the person reading just says, thank you. And then you have to react to that person saying, thank you. you I don't want to call my friends, make them get in their car, drive to my house. I have to set up all the lights and the green screen or the blue screen or the gray screen and have them deal with all that for probably 20,000 people are all submitting the same one line to the you know, to casting directors. This is just going to make their lives so much easier so that they don't have to bother other people and they don't have to do anything 
that, that puts them out either. It's all on their own time. You click a button, it goes right to the thing, you upload your script, the artificial intelligence parses your script so that it breaks it down into scenes, it breaks it down into what your dialogue is. You could change the speed of the avatar, you could change the dialect, you could change the tone. Um, it's a learning um, artificial intelligence too, so eventually we're gonna start having some sort of diction and, and emotion, um, which will be great. But right now, you wouldn't even know you're interacting with a, a computer. Like their voices sound perfect. Um, and it's just gonna really make this industry so much easier. And I, that's all I wanna do. Obviously, I wanna make money, right? This is a business, um, but we're keeping our price points so low that we're not gonna be insanely you know, rich off of it. I just wanna make this industry easier for people. You know, I have friends of mine that are managers and agents and they keep coming to me and saying, you know, they didn't get their audition done again. And my brain wants to explode when I hear that because I've never missed an audition ever in my life. I've actually been on vacation in Virginia with my wife and got an audition for one line on Boardwalk Empire before I got the role. And I looked at my wife and she went, you got an audition. I go, yeah, I'm going to fly home tonight. She goes, are you kidding me? She's like, how much is that going to cost? I was like, I don't know. I look it up. Looked it up, it was like 350 bucks. She goes, how much you get paid if you book it? 800 and something? She goes, is it worth it? I go, it's not about the money, it's about the opportunity. If I get that role, it's one more credit, one more scene, one more of this. And the role, that, that audition was like, I think I said something like halt. You know, so it was like, but it was in person. So I had to do that. Caesar, who goes there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was, it was an opportunity. And I, I'm dumbfounded in the fact that people pass up any opportunity to be in any project that they want to be in, you know, to be on a network television show, to be on a show that's on HBO, you know, one of the greatest, you know, cable networks and uh, not cable networks, paid networks in the world to say anything. Do you know how many people would give anything to have that opportunity? Millions and millions and millions of people. And people just don't do it because they don't have the time. So we really want to make everything just as easy as possible, as simple as possible so that people go, you don't have an excuse anymore. Click on that link. I forgot one of your uh, roles in film, TV, in reinventing Anna. Oh, inventing, inventing, Anna. inventing Anna. Yeah, yeah, that was great. You know, uh, that was, <laughs> it was a great, it was a great project, um, and it, it was, it, but it was also f full of heartbreak for me. I was supposed to be in multiple episodes of that series. We filmed. December 10th was the last day of filming pre-pandemic. Pandemic happens and we halted production for the entire length of, of uh, the pandemic. And by the time the pandemic was over, they moved the entire production to California and fired every New York actor, essentially. You know, the Anthony Edwards and the Julia Gardners, they stayed. Um, but the, the lower level actors like myself, we, they just said, hey, they, they cut all the roles down. They simplified the plot lines to try to get rid of as many people as they could. And unfortunately, you were one of them. So, you know, I went from having conversations with Betsy Beers, who's Shonda Rhimes' partner, and the writers would come up to me and go, what you're doing is amazing. I, I'm having such a fun time writing your next episode to you're done. And I was like, <sighs> and then I didn't even know if I was going to be in it at that point because I didn't know if they cut the character out altogether. So then I get a call, you know, months later, like, oh, you have some VO to do. And I was like, oh, thank God. I'm like, I'm in it in some capacity, but I didn't know what it was. And, and you know, the episodes that I were in, was in, um, you know, they turned out great. And I had a really integral part in, like, the plot line. Um, so I was really excited about it. And it was great. And it's always great to just have, like, you know, Netflix is such a beast that millions and millions and millions of people are watching. So I'm getting text messages and calls every, like, three days. Yeah, like, you know, I always get the, the, the and it happens all the time, I, I get the, I didn't recognize you, but I definitely recognize your voice. And I'm like, yeah, I got one of those like really distinct voices. Um, you know, or it'd be like, I was, kitchen, I was cooking in the kitchen and I, and I heard you and I go, wait a minute, why does it sound like Nick? <laughs> I'm like, cause it was Nick. Um, but yeah, it was a great opportunity for me because I got to play a different character. I, I tend to play a little bit more like harsher characters. And this was like a, a quieter, nerdy, uh, like a stammering, a little less confident character, which, you know, I, I loved playing and it really just got to show a different side of me that I was really happy about. What would you like our audiences to know about entertain access? <laughs> um, how can they find out about it? What would you like them to know? 
Well, right now we, we launched our beta. Um, you can actually go to entertainaccess.com, sign up for an, a free account, um, get your profile up there if you wanted to. Um, we're going to be launching the full platform uh, right around the beginning of the new year, um, which we're really excited about. Once the beta is out of, uh, for the audition assistant, we'll be launching that probably in the next two or three weeks. Um, you know, we have a, a, a great team. Um, our CFO, Gene Fish uh, Jr., who you are very familiar with, uh, has really been helping us trying to get the name out there for people that, are, that have the connections in the industry, um, you know, the big casting directors, which we have a lot of connections with them as well, obviously being in the business for 20 years. Um, but yeah, you could sign up. We're, you know, we're, right now we're not advertising hard because we haven't launched a full product and we're still in beta for the audition assistant. But once we do, you'll hear our name probably regularly because I really think it's going to be just a, a staple in our industry. I think it's not only going to rev revolutionize our, the theater, film, TV industry, but I think that lawyers are going to be able to use this. We forgot one thing about this, that they're all water tested. Mm -hmm. there, no one can get your material. Yeah. So we, we're using um, two levels of security, centralized and decentralized. So our security will be on the blockchain, which uh, essentially means it, it leaves an a unseen encrypted code in every video, every script that you won't be able to see. But if somebody releases your video um, or if somebody releases your documentation, we'll be able to track that within an instant and find out exactly who it came from in the moment. Which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, seriously amazing, because it means that you can get people high up in the industry that still have to audition, that, that they are gonna feel safe. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like our audiences to know? Well, you just touched on something that's really important. Um, you know, we're, we're allowing um, our users to own their own content. We're not gonna take ownership of content, which is what um, most of our competitors do. They own the videos, they own the content, they own the scripts once it's uploaded. Um, we're not gonna do that. We wanna keep everything uh, as ethical as possible. Our lawyer, um, when writing up all of our documents for our subscription agreement for you know anybody who wants to be an investor, which we are currently looking for investors, um, when we wrote our documents up, he said, are you guys gonna uh, sell your data? And we said, absolutely not. And he goes, are you sure? And I said, absolutely not. And he goes, you're one of the only companies that would do that. I said, we don't need to sell data to make money. We need clients to make money. I said, and if I, was fa if I found out that they were selling my data, I'd have, you'd have one less client. I said, so we're gonna retain our subscriptions by keeping this company ethical, and that should in turn bring the same money as selling data to third, you know, third party companies. Um, we just really wanna do things above board. I, I, I just want to be a part of this business, you know, if that's not clear. <laughs> I am so glad that you came on as my guest today. <laughs> my guest today has been Nicholas Calhoun. I'm Susanna Bowling, and this is live from the Hotel Edison. Times Square Chronicles presents. I would love to thank Magda Katz, who does our video and makes us look and sound good, to Romel Gopez, and the Edison Hotel, who have given us a home and have always made us feel welcome, to Chuck Armstrong and the Wonderama crew for lights. Thank you very much.